good evening. It's a great pleasure to be here, and uh, BSkyB are very glad that we're able to uh, support these uh, series of lectures and uh, talks. And I, I have to say, uh, Stephen and I have both uh, just come back from the G20, G8 uh, in Canada, um, and uh, therefore uh, probably makes even more pertinent than ever uh, the thoughts in this book, uh, Good Value, uh, reflections on money, morality, and an uncertain world, uh, which uh, Stephen uh, published last year, just coming out in paperback. There are copies here, and uh, you'll be able to uh, buy them at the end of the evening, and Stephen's kindly of to, want to. <laughs> to, to, to sign some. Well, I'm sure you will want to, because it's absolutely fascinating. It's got everything from uh, Dr. Faustus to Neil Ferguson in it. Um, uh, and uh, the only thing I should say is slightly apologize in worse cocktail party style. We're going to talk past each other tonight. That's so we're facing you, not because we're waiting for a more interesting guest to appear in the room. <laughs> um, so, so, Stephen, can I just start by asking you, you are obviously a very busy man, uh, a lifelong banker. You're also uh, an ordained minister, I think, in the Church of England. Why write this book? What prompted you to write it? Well, what prompted me to write it was actually the specific trigger was finding myself at a conference in, um, in, in, in the rather agreeable circumstances of Lake Como in, in April 2008. And, I was, uh, and this was at a time when the thunderclouds were gathering. The, uh, 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 there, was, there were clearly sort of ominous rumblings of, of difficulty that hadn't yet... There was some there'd been the early squalls. Say a squall, Northern Rock had already occurred by then. Uh, but it was clearly becoming a major global issue. And I found myself kind of wanting to think about some of the wider implications of this. Um, and so I started kind of jotting down thoughts. Um, and then as I started to get into it, the, the canvas broadens out. And you ask, you ask about the whole way globalization is working. And that leads you to ask, what are its origins? And so you end up with quite a, quite a broad canvas. And the result's the book. Yeah, I should say, we're, we're going to talk for about 20 minutes or so, and then we'd uh, like you to join in the conversation with your questions. I'm just going to uh, try and investigate some of Stephen's themes. I mean, is it fair to say that it is a book prompted partly by the credit crunch and the banking crisis, but not directly about that? Yes, it is exactly right. It, it was prompted by it. It's triggered, as I say, by uh, uh, some conversations in the early stages of it. But it, it actually it turns out as you will recognize that to be something much broader, looking really at the whole process of globalization and urbanization and kind of asking or trying to ask, what does that do to the human spirit? And you, you start out, uh, I suppose, really with a, a philosophical uh, investigation uh, to a certain extent of the human spirit using T.S. Eliot and others, but I, I get the impression that your, your favorite philosopher of all is someone who's a bit obscure, I think, to most of us, Pierre Teilhard de Chardin. Would that... not, not my most favorite of all, but he was a, a very interesting thinker and I believe one of the most important thinkers of the 20th century. He was a French Jesuit priest, in fact, uh, who was well known as a paleontologist, worked in China in the 1920s and 30s. And he wrote this book called The Phenomenon of Man, which is uh, uh, well known, actually, uh, still in print, uh, which looked at the way in which the origins of man spreading out around the sphere, meeting each other up as we do spread around this sphere, um, creates an ever more intensive human re reaction which changes the nature of our consciousness. And it's that exploration of the way consciousness itself is changed as globalization proceeds that I find endlessly so fascinating. So it's this interaction yeah. of, of a human society yeah. that fascinates you and yeah. fascinated yeah. him. I, I mean, to say he's the most important philosopher, no, I wouldn't, but I think he is a very influential thinker. And he, he basically came up with this idea of a kind of um, sort of worldwide web of thought. Would that yeah, be right? Yeah, he did. He did. I mean, long before you actually had a worldwide web, you can see him toying, and he had no idea about the digital revolution, obviously. You can see him toying with the way in which worldwide connectivity of thinking starts to change human beings. And how does this insight, if you like, impact with commerce, business, banking? Well, I think the, the connection is this, that as humanity spread out in the early dawn of history uh, and, and started to come into contact with itself more and more broadly, it did one of two things. It either fought with, each other, with itself or it traded with itself. And trade and commerce is something you can trace back to the earliest beginnings of human history. 
as trade developed, so eventually you started to see cities develop. And so the two great phenomena of our times, globalization and urbanization, are actually very deeply rooted in the earliest beginnings of human history. And, and you... And they're linked to commerce. I mean, you argue in this book that capitalism, uh, as we know it, is different from fascism or communism uh, or anarchism in as much as you argue capitalism is a natural state, one of the natural yeah, states. Yeah, I do. I, I, I do argue that unlike other isms, which are isms in the sense that they're philosophies or political movements that have sought to impose uh, a mode of thought or a way of life or a structure of human society on people, capitalism is actually a word that describes the default mode of human interaction in the global bazaar. And that essentially, therefore, means that you know, we, we have, if you like, no escape from the market. I, I don't think we do at root. I mean, that, that opens a whole conversation about the way the markets operate, obviously. Well, we'll come back but to I that think in a bit, but... the basic notion that humans, there's something intrinsically human about trading and bartering and exchanging in a bazaar or in a market is, I do argue, something very deeply rooted in the human psyche and very deeply rooted in human history. But really what this book, Good Value, is about is about, in a sense, going beyond that, going beyond, if you like, Milton Friedman's view that the job of, uh, of a useful member of society is to trade and not be dishonest. Well, I certainly don't think Milton Friedman's view is an adequate description of our social responsibilities, no. Um, and the markets, as they have evolved over, over human history, have become very complex. Uh, at their best, they are a powerful creator of human wealth. They have lifted hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. Uh, and at their worst, they're socially disruptive. Uh, they're a poisonous weed. And, and in, in that sense, of course, they're like almost any other aspect of human endeavor that you come into contact with. You want to say that at its best, it's creative, it's inventive, it's powerfully generative of human well-being. At its worst, it's something evil. I wouldn't hesitate to use the word. And, and did you feel this sort of in the 80s when uh, Friedman was being lionized by uh, Thatcher and, and Reagan and others? Did you think in the, in the bank we're going in the wrong direction? Well, I, look, I, I, I don't think it's ever been true that, that a pure Friedmanite view of the world uh, char has characterized all of what we now associated with the markets and commerce. What I think is true to say is that in the last 10 to 15 years, let's say, there has been a culture of what you might describe as market fundamentalism that has become increasingly pervasive, actually not only in the financial markets, but much more broadly in society. Uh, and, and, and market fundamentalism is encapsulated by that sense that the only measure of value is the market. And another way of putting it is uh, it's an attitude of mind that sort of says to itself, if I've got a product and there's a market for it and I've got a contract and it's legal, I don't have to ask any other questions about rightness or suitability or fairness. That's market fundamentalism. We have seen too much of that in recent years. Uh, and I think if there's a piece of good news about the current crisis, it is that people are now asking some quite fundamental questions about what is the real role of the market. And you, I mean, interestingly, in your analysis of that, you go back, if you like, to earlier philosophers, Pollyanni and, and Marx, even, to a certain extent, yep, sure. arguing that yep. what the, there are inherent inbuilt flaws in the market. Yeah, and indeed there are inherent inbuilt flaws in the market. Um, the market... Uh, will never be perfect in the textbook Friedmanite sense of the word uh, and it's and can't ever be I, think, I mean partly there's a fundamental human truth here that the humans get involved in anything they foul it up part of the time at least and that's as true of the process of and, trade and, and always exchange, will yeah. and always will and that's as true of the process of trade and exchange as it is of any other area of human activity and we need to recognize that fact and we need to address specific issues in the markets, and we've had a few specific issues in the markets of late, uh, in, in, with that understanding of human nature in the background. What I do think, I, I am enough of a pro-market believer, I, I am enough of a believer that the markets are a central engine of human economic and social development, and I would absolutely argue that the start lesson of the 20th century was that if you take the other alternatives, and they have now been tried, that is the po one of the learnings of the 20th century, the results are truly terrible. And therefore, one, there's no turning back, 
Two, there are no other alternatives. And three, therefore, we have to find the way forward that involves a real inspection of what went wrong, a real understanding of the human dimension to this, and making sure that we do the right learnings. Let, let's just take the evolution as you see it. You've, you've mentioned globalization. Before globalization it comes, it comes urbanization, you, you believe? Is well, I think they're linked. Yeah. I, I think they're linked from, from very early times. Um, the very early cities of the world started to be created usually around ports or rivers where there was a place that it was convenient to exchange goods and services. That is the origin of many of the world's cities. Uh, later on, of course, came the Industrial Revolution, which created a whole new range of cities based on where the natural resources were. Uh, perfect examples of this, Birmingham or Essen, are two currently large cities, both of which have populations of less than 5,000 up until the beginning of the 19th century, which sprung into life as a result of the Industrial Revolution. But it's almost always connected with trade and exchange. And, and interesting, often with a religious connection as well, of, of one kind or another. And in some uh, way, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh, yeah. Yes, going back to the Middle Ages, yeah. And at what point does your trade, banking, the whole, whole question of uh, credit and debt come into it? I mean, you, you quote Neil Ferguson, I think with approval, when he says, credit and debt, in short, are among the essential building blocks of economic development, as vital to creating the wealth of nations as mining, manufacturing, or mobile telephony. You do, you do I do believe that. I mean, yeah. clearly, you know, credit and debt can clearly get out of order and get excessive, but you can't run any modern normal society and economy without having a, an effective, functioning, vibrant financial system as part of it. You can't, you can't build up economies in any other way. And in, actually, one of the interesting things about the crisis is, uh, we talk about a crisis actually because it's largely a Western crisis rather than a global crisis in so many ways, uh, and if you look at China, for instance, uh, a country which has developed very rapidly in recent years, famously so, uh, which has spent a lot of effort uh, in, in making sure that its banks are strong and, and well run, such that they did not suffer in the crisis, and is now absolutely committed to continuing to develop its capital markets because it believes that whatever the that it believes there are clearly lessons to be learned, but the lesson they do not believe is there to be learned is that you can do without the capital markets as a further engine of their continued growth. But, uh, I mean, as I understand it, in, in terms of what prompted you to write this book, it, it was how capitalism, how banking developed into casino capitalism, and, and it's often seen as really the money and the figures getting dislocated yeah, from anything and, that and any they, normal and, person and they, understood. And they plainly did. I mean, there are all sorts of distortions that got worse and worse and worse in the go-go years, and, and when the bubble burst, it's extremely painful. And what we learned was that it, 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 capitalism doesn't self-regulate, effectively. You, you certainly learned that the markets don't self-regulate. Uh, and that then, I, I, you know, I think everybody would recognize now, looking back on the last few years, there were clear failures. There were failures, first of all, of bank managements, uh, there were failures of bank governance at board level. There were also failures in the regulatory environment. And all of this in the context of a whole world economy that was getting increasingly imbalanced, you know, with big surpluses building up in one part of the world, big, big debts building up in another part of the world, big export positions, big import positions. There was clearly a lot of imbalance in the real economy, fed and exacerbated by what was going on in the financial and, and, and why was it, I mean, you, you don't go into this in the book, but just perhaps you'll let us in on this, why was it that relatively speaking, of the big brand, the banking brand names, your bank, HSBC, was relatively insulated from all well, of this. Good, of, good I mean, policy or China, <laughs> was it? Uh, uh, China? I mean, we were not unscathed, and we had one or two investments in the US in particular, which, which <laughs> did, did not cover the, themselves in glory, to say the least. But uh, broadly speaking, yes, we and a number of other banks uh, have navigated the crisis reasonably successfully. And I do think, uh, I, I don't particularly want to talk about HSBC yeah. and blow its trumpet, but if you look at the banks and systems that didn't have problems, in Canada and Australia, neither of them had banking systems that got into trouble. Now, part of the reason is because they were adequately capitalized, because they, uh, certainly in the case of Canadians, were perfectly liquid, didn't gear themselves up too much. And you can see some what are in many ways basic traditional principles of banking that got lost sight of. And you can also see in certain jurisdictions regulatory uh, uh, environments that lost sight of the need to police those basic principles. 
So you can point, you've, in, in some senses, what happened is not all that mysterious. But the, the difficulty for the businessman, yeah, I mean, you write about tulip mania in, in, in the book, is at what point when money is being made, you get off or yeah, you don't it, participate yeah, it, in it, that indeed, spiral. Indeed. I mean, it is worth recognizing financial crises are not new. Um, in fact, there's a kind of 800-year history of financial crises. Um, the earliest known sovereign, at least, to default on his debts was Edward III in this country. And then you've had the tulip mania, the South Sea Buddle, the railway bonds in the United States in the 19th century, and so forth through 1929, uh, and various things since. There is something about the markets. Uh, any inspection of the history of the markets tells you they are not intrinsically stable and therefore need to be policed. And I come back to what I said earlier. At their best, they are, they are essential to modern economic and social development and very effective in, in facilitating ex economic and social development. At their worst, they're destructive and dangerous. And, and you, you know, to use the famous phrase, greed is good, you certainly don't believe greed is good, but you do believe profit is good. Oh, I think, I think if, if you're going to have develop, uh, economic and social development done with the private sector leading, leading that charge, you've got to expect the capital that comes into businesses, whether it's banks or anybody else, to earn a return on the capital. So to that extent, I think profit's important, an important part of the system. But I do think the responsibility of boards and, and senior managements of businesses to which capital is entrusted is not short-termist in, in, in its nature. They, they, uh, there's a, there's a long-term responsibility for sustainable development of the profitable business that is the real charge uh, of those in, respons in responsibility. And as I see it, correct me if I've, I've, I've misunderstood this, you see parallels between sort of individual Western overconsumption and the greed of the banks, if you like. It was, it was well, I, I think they are both manifestations of something that did become quite pervasive, as I was saying. I think yeah. this market fundamentalist ethos, if you'll bear with me with the term, was something that was much more pervasive than just the banks. So, so how at the, at, the, at the level of the banking system, the financial system, what they've all been talking about in, uh, in Toronto and elsewhere and going to be talking about in Seoul, I mean, in your view, you say that there's going to be an essential rebalancing of, of, of the world economy. Well, I hope there's going to be. <laughs> uh, and you say it will lead to a new world order. What, what, what do you think that new world order will be? Well, I, 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 think, I think, firstly, I do think we need to find our way to a better macroeconomic balance. And that is a challenge for America, for the Asians, uh, even within individual countries. I mean, very clear that this economy needed rebalancing. I mean, it is interesting that if you look at employment in this country in, in the early part of this decade, there was a linear rise, a quite a steep clip, uh, in employment in financial services, real estate, and construction, and a linear decline at about the same gradient in manufacturing and agriculture. Uh, and this is a sign it was getting more and more unbalanced. And you can point to specific reasons why that was true. Uh, I don't want to go get too technical about it. We need to correct that. Um, and so, yes, that's one thing, more balanced macroeconomic development, clearly a stronger process of supervision of the financial markets, uh, and I think we're beginning to see the contours of that coming through over, over recent months and the next few months. I think the other thing that was, was uh, uh, to be honest, I haven't read the communique, so I don't know how strongly this came through. I know there was some discussion on Saturday, is the importance of continued development of a kind of a free trade and investment approach to the global economy, continuing with the Doha round, if at all possible. We all know what the political difficulties with that are, but if you do want an economy at the global level that is capable of delivering uh, a growth uh, for the benefit of the marginalized and the poorer countries, there are lots and lots of difficulties in this. We all know about that. But keeping going with that difficult agenda, I think, is of fundamental importance. And the big difference to the 80s, if you like, is now that there has to be an acceptance that there's a big role for government in this and, and by association, a pretty big role for the taxpayer at one level or another. Well, I, th I think yes, yes and no. I mean, one of the tasks is to prevent the situations arising again where it is the taxpayer that gets stuck with a bill for failed banks. Um, so one would hope that the outcome is less burden on a taxpayer in that specific sense. Um, that government internationally has to provide supervision of the process of development and, the, and of the markets. Yes, I take that as um, obvious, actually. 
Um, I, the thing what I'd add to that is that almost all of the important decisions now require international coordination. That uh, in, Indeed, I think when the history books are written in, let's say, 25 or 50 years' time about these present years, they will focus on the rise of the G20 and the relative marginalization of the G7, G8, because the G20 reflects the rise of some important new countries on the world stage and the rebalancing of the world economy that's taking place kind of before our I mean, I mean you, may, you believe firmly that rebalancing is to the east, is, is to oh, yeah. China. Oh, yeah, I, I think that's just, I don't think anybody could dispute that that's what's happening. Some people raise the question about whether it's, whether it's can continue, whether there's some great implosion going to take place. I don't believe it. I think this rebalancing will continue for the next generation. Um, and, and it's important to remember, of course, that when we use the phrase emerging markets, that's actually a misnomer. In many cases, we're talking about the re-emergence of countries that used to have a much greater prominence on the world stage. It is only in the 19th and 20th centuries that you saw the emergence of what was a historical abnormality, namely the dominance of one or two superpowers in the West. I mean, you make the point, I think, that... Uh China has been the world's biggest economy for 18 of the last 20 yeah, up, up until about 1820, China was the largest economy in the world. What we're going to see from approximately 10 years from now is that China's going to be the largest country, uh, economy in the world. And is, is that a threat to our values? I, I don't think, personally, I don't think it's a threat to values. I, I clearly, I think in business and economic terms... Well, our morality, about, perhaps. I think. Well, let me come back to that. Yeah. We're, we're talking about companies and, and, indeed, individuals. Every single one of us, both at company level and as individuals, is going to have to think about the opportunities, the challenges, the threats, if you will, that the rebalancing of the world carries for us. I, I happen to believe, perhaps I'm just a born optimist, that there are as many opp opportunities in this as there are threats and, and uncertainties. Um, uh, f just for example, at the economic level, there is no reason to believe that a China or an India is going to be autarkic in its consumption patterns, and, uh, and all of the signs are that as people get a bit more affluence, they want the same sorts of things that the rest of us want, and therefore there are plenty Liberty. of trading opportunities that come from that. Now, on, on culture and, and ways of thinking about what is the right order of society, I think there will be some quite complicated uh, uh, discussions. You but again, even there, I think the tremendous opportunities and tre tremendous enrichment possibilities. I mean, one of, one of the immense privileges that my job gives to me is you get to see a few things. And you know, I remember being in Beijing for the Beijing Music Festival the year before last, where you had um, a, a Chinese orchestra playing uh, with Lang Lang, the now famous uh, pianist, for the first time, I think, with, with much of the Beijing kind of establishment there, Brahms' first piano concerto. And just being there as part of the almost tangible impact that had tells you that cultural enrichment is, is a hugely fascinating part of this globalization that's going on. And, I mean, interesting, you, you, you also argue in this book, I mean, it's a very optimistic book in the sense that... Uh, the well, not, I hope not naively so, not, but I no, fundamentally, I, I yeah. at the I end of the day, I didn't yes. use the word naive. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that, that what's come out of the difficult economic period we're going through is what you call sustainability, what others call corporate social responsibility at company level, a realisation that respecting those values in the round is actually good business. I, I certainly believe that at the end of the day, if you, if, you, if you take the view that your job in business is to grow the business profitably and sustainably, that means that you have to think about uh, uh, your relationships with your customers. It comes back to those kind of fairness issues in, in dealing with customers. It means you think about the engagement of your people constructively and over the long term. And, and both of those two increasingly demand that you take a proactive and responsible position vis-a-vis -vis the communities in which you do the business. And so the more you think about sustainable profit development, the more you are taken into a much broader sense of the responsibility of the company. Does that mean that companies get it right all the time? Plainly not. Is this new learning for, for, for many people? Yes, it may be. Um, but I think the imperative is kind of there, and it is, I believe, one of the benefits of the crisis, if I can use that provocative phrase, that some of these things are coming to the fore and being discussed overtly in a way that would not have been true even five years ago, let alone 10 or 15 years ago. I mean, the, 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 the point being that it is more sustainable to run a business on that basis than on a sort of old 
imperialistic model well, of, a of, of extraction. A, or a that, but B, also it takes you away from this kind of quick win sense that, that the, my only job is to get the quick buck, the next transaction, and gouge it as much as possible. That kind of ethos is something we've all got to um, protest loudly against. Finally, what about the individual? I mean, there's a, a really enjoyable discussion of Faust and Faustus uh, uh, in the book, one of my favorite characters. But um, you, you come up in the end with sort of fulfillment principles, as, as you call them, or principles of, 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 of fulfillment for someone who is going about an, a normal business life. How do they work? Well, I, I, I mean, I do think that, that, that when you think about human nature, the vast majority of people do actually want to be able to look at themselves in the mirror and say, the job of work that I happen to be doing is a job of work which makes some form of contribution to, for want of a better word, the common good. I, it is true of most people that the money may well be important to them, but is not the be-all and end-all. And, and, and the evidence is enormous that it, people who make it the be-all and end-all do not achieve real satisfaction. And the, all the old cliches are actually true, and people will find that out sooner or later. I think the same thing is true of power and ambition. Um, and I think at the end of the day, it is clear from the wisdom of, of, of the ages, whether it's out of the kind of culture that you and I have grown up in, or I, are out of other cultures like the Chinese culture that we've just been talking about, the wisdom of the ages is that you find satisfaction, you find fulfillment in a more integrated view of the way you run your life and a more a wiser sense of what's really important. And, and you write about friends, colleagues, people you've known who've you know, given up the high powered job and gone and worked with, uh, dedicated their life to working with orphans in India or, or For whatever. Example, yeah. Well, yeah. What is the answer to why shouldn't we all do that? Well, I, I, I mean, I think and I do talk about a couple of specific people yeah. who I know uh, who have done exactly that. Um, well, actually, in one case, done exactly that. The other has not, in fact, opted out of corporate life, but, but spends a lot of free time on it. I, I, I think some people are cut out for that, called to do that, if I can use that phrase. Uh, I think it's absolutely clear that if everybody did that, the whole thing will fall over. In other words, success in that kind of role in life depends on most of us not doing it, for the obvious point that they, they, they need support in resources, um, both financial resources uh, and other kinds of support. Um, there's a, I didn't talk about this in the book, but there's a very interesting book that I only read after writing it. If I ever redo this, I wouldn't mm. want to include this. By a Franciscan author writing about Franciscan thought from the Middle Ages, now, that might seem impossibly remote from the circumstances of modern, urbanized, globalized life. And yet what they were saying is, in effect, that there's a, there's a kind of polity where different people have reasonable roles, and some can be you know, on, on the streets with the, with, with the homeless, uh, and others have a role to play in supporting that. And these are, these are Franciscans. Uh, and I think that's kind of interesting. Uh, and there's a general truth about that. I, 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 but I can't leave it at that because what, what I would want to say in the next breath to those who do the normal things instead of the striking and abnormal things is that the demands placed in terms of um, giving on those people should be considered to be very extensive. And, and just finally, for you, there's also a, a spiritual dimension. I mean, it, it's by no sense a, a book about well, only indirectly about a spiritual journey, but you do in the end talk about both original sin and original grace. Yes, yes. Well, I, uh, at the, the end of the day, you know, I've got a particular perspective, and, and indeed we all have prisms through which we see the world and understand our own, uh, uh, our own metaphysics and our own sense of what's morally important. We, all, we, we can't avoid having a prism, uh, and in the end I do talk about mine. Uh, and, and one of those is about uh, the insights that, are, that, are, that in particular Christian view of carries with it, and I think one of them is, is a truth about human nature, which is formulated in theological terms uh, through those phrases, original sin and original grace. What they are saying, what those words say is uh, that actually human endeavor is infinitely precious and important and constantly wayward, and these are enduring facts of human experience. I, I could come at this from two different ways. I could come at it from a perspective of a specific theology that, that happens to be one that I subscribe to, but I could also come at it from human experience down the ages. I think there's massive evidence for the truth of the proposition. Stephen Green, thank you very much indeed.